Okay.
Alrighty. Let's see. Okay. Just checking things out before we get going. Everyone's doing well tonight. Okay. Make sure that's working there. All right. That's good. All right. Make sure I got the book here. Perfect. All right. Well, let's jump right into it. View here, or it's a story view. There we go. Previously on Tom Swift and his motorboat. Well, in chapter 12, Tom made it home to check to see if there was anything going on there and make sure everything was good at home. And who did he bump into? Happy Harry. Chapter 13 Tom in Danger. Garrett! Garrett Jackson! cried Tom as he struggled through the hedge of bushes and ran after the men. Where are you, Garrett? Come on and help me chase these men. But there came no answer to Tom's hail. He could not hear the sound of the retreating footsteps of the men now and concluded that they had made their escape. Still, he would not give up, but dashed on, slipping and stumbling, now and then colliding with a tree. What can they be doing here? thought Tom in great anxiety. Are they after some more of Dad's inventions because they didn't get his turbine motor? Hello, who's there? Who are you? called a voice suddenly. Oh, Garrett, where have you been? asked the young inventor, recognizing the tones of his father's keeper. I've been calling you. Some of those scoundrels are around again. Why, if it isn't Tom, ejaculated the engineer. Wow, there's a turn of a phrase. Okay. However in the world did you get here? I thought you were at Sandport. I'll explain later, Garrett. Just now I want to catch those men if I can. Which men? Happy Harry and another one. I saw them hiding down by the orchard path. Come on, they're right ahead of us. But though they hunted as well as they were able to in the fast-gathering darkness, there was no trace of the intruders. They had to give up, and Tom, after going to the boathouse to see that the arrow was all right, returned to the house, where he told the engineer and housekeeper what had brought him back and how he had surprised the two men. "'Is everything all right, Garrett?' he concluded. "'Dad is nervous and frightened. I must telephone him at the hotel tonight and let him know, for I promised to come back. I can't, though, until tomorrow.' "'Everything's all right as far as I know.' answered Jackson. I've kept a careful watch, and the burglar alarm has been in working order. Mrs. Baggert and I haven't been disturbed a single night since you went away. It's curious that the men should be here the very night you came back. Maybe they followed you. I hardly think so, for they didn't know I was coming. You can't tell what those fellows know, commented the engineer. But, anyhow, I don't suppose you could have gotten here from Sandport as soon as you did. 
Oh, yes, they could in their automobile, declared Tom. But I don't believe they knew I was coming. They knew we were away, however, and thought it would be a good time to steal something, I guess. Are you sure nothing's been taken? Perfectly sure, but you and I will take a look around the shop. They made a hasty examination, but found nothing disturbed and no signs that anyone had tried to break in. I think I'll telephone Dad that everything's all right, decided Tom. It is as far as his inventions are concerned, and if I tell about seeing the men, it will only worry him. I can explain the part better when I see him. But when I go back, Garrett, you will have to be on your guard, since those men are in the neighborhood. I will, Tom. Don't worry. Mr. Swift was soon informed by his son over the telephone that nothing in the shops had been disturbed, and the inventor received the news with evident satisfaction. He requested Tom to come back to the hotel in the morning in order that the three of them might go for a ride about the lake in the afternoon, and Tom decided to make an early start. The night passed without incident, though Tom, who kept the gun Mr. Duncan had gave, given him in readiness for use, got up several times, thinking he heard suspicious noises. After an early breakfast, and having once more cautioned the engineer and housekeeper to be on their guard, Tom started back in the arrow. As it would not be much out of his way, the young inventor decided to cut across the lake and stop at the sanitarium, that he might inquire about Mr. Duncan. He thought he could speed the arrow up sufficiently to make up for any time he might lose, and with this in mind, he headed out towards the middle of Lake Carlopa. The engine was working splendidly with the new spark plugs, and Tom was wondering if there was any possible method of getting more revolutions out of the motor. He had about come to the conclusion that a new propeller might answer his purpose when he heard the noise of an approaching boat. He looked up quickly and exclaimed, Andy Foger again, and Pete and Sam are with him. It's a wonder he wouldn't go off on a trip instead of cruising around so near home. Guess he's afraid he'll get stuck. Idly, Tom watched the red streak. It was cutting through the water at a fast rate, throwing up curling foam on either side of the sharp bow. He seems to be heading this way, mused Tom. Well, I'm not going to race with him today. Nearer and nearer came the speedy craft, straight for the arrow. The young inventor shifted his helm in order to get out of Andy's course, but to his surprise, he saw that the red-haired lad changed the direction of his own boat. Guess he wants to see how close he can come to me, <coughs> thought our hero. Maybe he wants to show how fast he's going. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> The red streak was now so close that the features of the occupants could easily be distinguished. There were grins on the faces of Andy and his cronies. Get out of the way or we'll run you down, cried the bully. We've got the right of way. Don't you try anything like that, shouted Tom in some alarm. Not that he was afraid of Andy, but the red streak was getting dangerously near. And he knew Andy was not a skilled helmsman. The auto boat was now headed directly at the arrow and coming on speedily. Andy was bending over the wheel, and Tom had begun to turn his in order to get well out of the way of the insolent, squint-eyed lad and his friends. Suddenly, Andy uttered a cry and leaped up. Look out! Look out! He yelled. My steering gear is broken! I can't change my course! Look out! The red streak was bearing right down on Tom's boat. Shut off your power! Reverse! shouted Tom. Andy seemed confused and did not know what to do. Sam Snedeker sprang to the side of his crony, but he even knew less about a motorboat. He looked as though Tom would be run down, and he was in great danger. But the young inventor did not lose his head. He put his wheel hard and o his, he put his wheel hard over, and then, leaping to his motor, sent it full speed forward. Not a moment too soon had he acted, for an instant later the other boat shot past the stern of the arrow, hitting it a severe but glancing blow. Tom's boat quivered from end to end, and he quickly shut off the power. By this time, Andy had succeeded in slowing down his craft. 
The young inventor hastily looked over the side of the arrow. One of the rudder fastenings had been torn loose. What do you mean by running me down? shouted Tom angrily. I, I, I didn't do it on purpose, returned Andy contritely. I was seeing how near I could come to you when my steering gear broke. I hope I haven't damaged you. My rudder's broken, went on Tom, and I've got to put back to repair it. I ought to have you arrested for this. I'll pay for the damage, replied Andy, and he was so frightened that he was white in spite of his tan and freckles. That won't do me any good now, retorted Tom. It'll delay me a couple of hours. If you try any tricks like that again, I'll complain to the authorities and you won't be allowed to run a boat on this lake. Andy knew that his rival was in the right and did not reply. The bully and his cronies busied themselves over the broken steering gear, and the young inventor, finding that he could make a shift to get back to his boathouse, turned his craft around and headed for there in order to repair the damage. End of chapter 13. All right. Flip this back. I'm going to grab myself a drink. All right. And let's check in with the chat room. Hey, Dwometh. Dwome. How you doing, buddy? Hoping you're having a good weekend. And another TV viewer. If that is your real name. Hope things are going well with you tonight, too. Yeah, man, only because I don't have a cup down here. Oh, well. Alrighty. righty. Oh, that Andy Foger. What are we going to do with him? All right. Back to the story. Previously on Chapter 13 of Tom Swift and His Motorboat. Well, Tom went to leave and head back to see his dad, but had another run-in with Andy Foger on Lake Carlopa. Chapter 14. The Arrow Disappears. Paying no heed to the occupants of the bully's boat, who by reason of their daring had been responsible for his accident that might have resulted seriously, Tom was soon at his dock. He had it conveniently arranged for hoisting craft out of the water to repair them, and in a few minutes the stern of the arrow was elevated so that he could get at the rudder. Well, it's not as bad as I thought, he remarked with a critical eye, when he noted that the damage done. Wow, that was really clunky. I can fix it in about an hour if Garrett helps me. Going up to the house to get some tools and to tell the engineer that he had returned, Tom looked out over the lake and saw Andy's boat moving slowly off. They've got her fixed up in some kind of shape, he murmured. It's a shame for a chump like Andy to have a good boat like that. He'll spoil it in one season. He's getting altogether too reckless. First thing he knows, he and I will have a clash and I'll pay back some of the old scores. Mr. Jackson was much surprised to see the young inventor home again so soon, as was also Mrs. Baggert. Tom explained what had happened, and he and the engineer went to work repairing the damage done by the Red Streak. As the owner of the Arrow had anticipated, the work did not take long, and shortly before dinner time, the boat was ready to resume the interrupted, the interrupted trip to Sandport. "'Better stay and have lunch!' urged Mrs. Baggert. He can hardly get to the hotel by night anyhow, and maybe it would be better not to start until tomorrow. No, I must get back tonight or Dad would be worried, declared Tom. I've been gone longer now than I calculated on, 
but I will have dinner here, and if necessary, I can do the last half of the trip after dark. I know the way now, and I have a compass and a good searchlight. The arrow was let down into the water again and tied outside the boathouse, ready for a quick start. The dinner Mrs. Baggert provided was so good that Tom lingered over it longer than he meant to, and he asked for a second apple dumpling with hard sauce on. So it was with a very comfortable feeling indeed, and with an almost forgiving spirit towards Andy Foger, that our heroes started down the path to the lake. Now for a quick run to Sandport, he said aloud. I hope I shan't see any more of those men that Dad hasn't been, and that Dad hasn't been bothered by them. His suspicions about the house weren't altogether unfounded, for I did see the tramp and someone else sneaking around, but I don't believe they'll be coming back now. Tom swung around the path that led to the dock. As he came in sight of the water, he stared as if he could not believe what he saw, or rather, what he did not see. For there was no craft tied to the string piece where he had fastened his motorboat. He looked again, rubbed his eyes to make sure, and then cried out, The arrow's gone! There was no doubt of it. The craft was not at the dock. Breaking into a run, Tom hastened to the boathouse. The arrow was not in there, and a look across the lake showed only a few rowboats in sight. That's mighty funny, mused the youth. I wonder... He paused suddenly in his thoughts. Maybe Garrett took it out to try and see if that worked all right? He said hopefully. He knows how to run a boat. Maybe he wanted to see how the rudder behaved and is out in it now. He got through dinner before I did, but I should have thought he'd said something to me if he was going out in it. This was the one weak point in Tom's theory, and he felt it at once. I'll see if Garrett's in his shop, he went on as he turned back toward the house. The first person he met as he headed for the group of small structures where Mr. Swift's inventive work was carried on was Garrett Jackson, the engineer. I... I thought you were out in my boat, stammered Tom. Your boat? Why would I be out in your boat? Mr. Jackson removed his pipe from his mouth and stared at the young inventor. Because it's gone. Gone, repeated the engineer. And then Tom told him. The two hurried down to the dock, but the addition of another pair of eyes was of no assistance in locating the arrow. The trim little motorcraft was nowhere to be seen. I can't understand it, said Tom helplessly. I wasn't gone more than an hour at dinner, and yet... It doesn't take long to steal a motorboat, commented the engineer. But I think I would have heard them start it, went on the lad. Maybe it drifted off, though I'm sure I tied it securely. No, there's not much likelihood of that. There's no wind today and no currents in the lake. But it could easily have been towed off by someone in a rowboat, and then you would not have heard the motor start. That's so, agreed the youth. That's probably how they did it. They sneaked up here in a rowboat and towed the arrow off. I'm sure of it. And I'll wager I know who did it, exclaimed Mr. Jackson energetically. Who? demanded Tom quickly. Those men who were sneaking around. Happy Harry and his gang. They stole the boat once and they'd do it again. Those men took your boat, Tom. The young inventor shook his head. No, he answered. I don't believe they did. Why not? Well, because they wouldn't dare come back here when they knew they, we were on the lookout for them. It would be too risky. Oh, those fellows don't care for risk, was the opinion of Mr. Jackson. Take my word for it. They have your boat. They've been keeping watch, and as soon as they saw the dock unprotected, they sneaked up and stole the arrow. I don't think so, repeated Mr. Swift's son. Who do you think took it, then? Andy Foger, was the quick, res quick response. I believe he and his cronies did it to annoy me, and they've been trying to get even with me, or at least Andy has, for outbidding him on the boat. He's tried several times, but he hasn't succeeded until now. I'm sure Andy Foger has my boat, said Tom and with a grim tightening of his lips, swung around as though to start an instant pursuit. "'Where are you going?' asked Mr. Jackson. 
to find Andy and his cronies. When I locate them, I'll make them tell me where my boat is. Hadn't you better send some word to your father? You can hardly get to Sandport now, and he'll be worried about you. That's so. I will. I'll telephone Dad that the boat... No, I'll not do that either, for he'd only worry and maybe get sick. I'll just tell him I've had a little accident, that Andy ran into me, and that I can't come back to the hotel for a day or two. Maybe I'll be lucky to find my boat in that time. But Dad won't worry then, and when I see him, I can explain. That's what I'll do. And Tom was soon talking to Mr. Swift by telephone. The inventor was very sorry his son could not come back to rejoin him and Ned, uh, to, to back to rejoin him and Ned, but there was no help for it. And with a cheerful voice, as much as he could assume anyway, the lad promised to start for Sandport at the earliest opportunity. Now to find Andy in my boat, Tom exclaimed as he hung up the telephone receiver. End of chapter 14. Alrighty. I don't know about you guys. Uh, I don't think it's Andy Foger. I think that's too obvious. And welcome to those of you who have joined us in the chat room again. Thank you for joining us again. I appreciate it. So... Yeah, I think it's more likely that it's probably Happy Harry and those guys rather than Andy Foger and those guys. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, this will be a good point to, uh, particularly those of you who are listening live, uh, if you have any suggestions for another book, go ahead and put it in the suggestion box below in the Twitch channel. If you are watching this on YouTube uh, in on the recording, Go ahead and leave a comment below the video and uh, let me know what kind of books you'd like to hear. Because we are a little bit more than halfway through this book and we are go going to be getting ready for our third book uh, pretty soon. Uh, I kind of like the idea of continuing the Tom Swift books, but I am open to other ideas as well. I'm toying around with the idea of doing a Christmas story. Um, to be released in time for Christmas, but we'll see how that goes. All right. Back to our story. Okay, previously on Tom Swift and his motorboat. In Chapter 14, Tom was back at home doing repairs on his boat, and stop for dinner when he went back out to head back to see his dad who stayed at the lake the boat was gone Tom thinks it's Andy Foger I don't think it's Andy Foger but we'll see chapter 15 a dismaying statement trouble is sometimes good in a way it makes a person resourceful Tom Swift has had his share of annoyances of late, but they had served a purpose. He had learned to think clearly and quickly. Now, when he found his boat stolen, he at once began to map out a plan of action. "'What will you do first? asked Mr. Jackson as he saw his employer's son hesitating. First, I'm going to Andy Foger's house,' declared the young inventor. "'If he's home, I'm going to tell him what I think of him. If he's not... I'm going to find him. Why don't you take your sailboat and run down to his dock? Suggested the engineer. It isn't as quick as your motorboat, but it's better than walking. So it is, exclaimed the lab. I will use my cat boat. I had forgotten all about it of late. I'm glad you spoke. He was soon sailing down the lake in the direction of the boathouse on the waterfront of Mr. Foger's property. It needed but a glance around the dock to show him that the red streak was not there. But Tom recollected the accident to the steering gear and thought perhaps Andy had taken his boat to some wharf where there was a repair shop and left it there to return home himself. But inquiry of Mrs. Foger, who was as nice a woman as her son was a mean lad, gave Tom the information that his enemy was not at home. 
He telephoned me that his boat was damaged, said Mrs. Foger gently, and that he'd taken it to get fixed. Then, he said, he and some friends were going on a little cruise and might not be back tonight. Did he say where he was going? asked our hero, who did not tell Andy's mother why he wanted to see her son. No, and I'm worried about him. Sometimes I think Andy is too, well, too impetuous, and I'm afraid he'll get into trouble. Tom, in spite of his trouble, could hardly forbear smiling. Andy's mother was totally unaware of the mean traits of her son and thought of him as a very fine chap. Tom was not going to undeceive her. I'm afraid something will happen to him, she went on. Do you think there's any danger being out on the lake in a motorboat, Mr. Swift? I understand you have one. Yes, I have one, answered Tom. He was going to say he had one once, but thought better of it. No, there is very little danger this time of year, he added. I'm very glad to hear you say so, went on Mrs. Foger with a sigh. I shall feel more at ease when Andy is away now. When he returns home, I shall tell him you called upon him, and he will return your visit. I'm glad to see that the custom of paying calls has not died out among the present generation. It's a pleasant habit, and I'm glad to have my son conform to it. He shall return your kind visit. Oh, no, it, it's of no consequence, replied Tom quickly, thinking grimly that his visit was far from a friendly one. There's no need to tell your son I was here. I'll probably see him in a day or two. Oh, but I shall tell him, insisted Mrs. Foger with a kind smile. I'm sure he will appreciate your call. There was much doubt concerning this in the mind of the young inventor, but he did not express it and soon took his leave. Up and down the lake for the rest of the day he cruised, looking in vain for a sight of Andy Foger in the Red Streak, but the racing boat appeared to be well hidden. If I could only find where they've taken mine, mused Tom. Hang it all, this is rotten luck. And for the first time, he began to feel discouraged. Maybe you'd better notify the police, suggested Mr. Jackson, when Tom returned to the Swift House that night. They might help locate it. I think I can do as well as the police, answered the youth. If the boat is anywhere, it's on the lake, and the police have no craft in which to make a search. That's so, agreed the engineer. I wish I could help you, but I don't believe it would be wise for me to leave the house, especially since those men have been about lately. No, you, you must stay here, was Tom's opinion. I'll take another day or two to search. By this time, Andy and his gang will return, I'm sure, and I can tackle them. Suppose they don't. Well, then, I'll make a tour of the lake in my sailboat, and I'll run up to Sandport and tell Dad, for he will wonder what's keeping me. I'll know better next time than to leave my boat at the dock without taking out the connection to, at the spark coil so no one can start the motor. I should have done that at first, but you always think of those things afterwards. The lad began his search again the next morning and cruised about in little bays and gulfs, looking for a sight of the red streak or the arrow but he saw neither, and a call at Andy's house showed that the red-haired youth had not returned. Mrs. Foger was quite nervous over her son's continued absence, but Mr. Foger thought it was okay. Another day passed without getting any results, and the young inventor was getting so nervous, partly with worrying over the loss of his boat and partly on his father's account, that he did not know what to do. I can't stand it any longer, he announced to Mrs. Baggert the night of the third day after a telephone message had been received from Mr. Swift. The inventor wanted to know why his son did not return to the hotel to join him and Ned. Well, what will you do? asked the housekeeper. If I don't find my boat tomorrow, I'll sail to Sandport, bring home Dad and Ned, and we three will go all over the lake. My, mo my boat must be somewhere on it. But Lake Carlopa is so cut up that it could easily be hidden. It's queer that the Foger boy doesn't come home. That makes it look as if he was guilty. Oh, I'm sure he took it all right, returned Tom. All I want is to see him. It certainly is queer that he stays away as long as he does. 
Sam Snedeker and Pete Bailey are with him, too. But they'll have to return sometime. Tom dreamed that night of finding his boat and that it was a wreck. He awoke, glad to find that the latter part was not true, but wishing that some of his night vision might come to pass during the day. He started out right after breakfast and, as usual, headed for the Foger home. He almost disliked to ask Mrs. Foger if her son had yet returned, for Andy's mother was so polite and so anxious to know whether any danger threatened that Tom had hardly knew how to, how to answer her. But he was saved that embarrassment on this occasion, for as he was going up the walk from the lake to the residence, he met the gardener and from him learned that Andy had not yet come back. But his mother had a message from him. I did hear, went on the man. He's on his way. It seems he had some trouble. Trouble? What kind of trouble? I don't rightly know, sir, but... And here the gardener winked his eye. Master Andy isn't particular what kind of trouble he gets into. That's right, agreed our hero. As he went down again to where he had left his boat, he thought. Nor what kind of trouble he gets other people into. I wish I had hold of him for about five minutes. The sailboat swung slowly from the dock and heeled over to the gentle breeze. Hardly knowing what to do, Tom headed for the middle of the lake. He was discouraged and tired of making plans only to have them fail. As he looked across the stretch of water, he saw a boat coming toward him. He shaded his eyes with his hand to see better and then, with a pair of marine glasses, took an observation. He uttered an, ex an exclamation. That's a red streak as sure as I'm alive, he cried. But what's the matter with her? They're rowing. The lad headed his boat toward the approaching one. There was no doubt about it. It was Andy Foger's craft, but it was not speeding forward under the power of the motor. Slowly and laborious, the occupants were pulling it along. And as it was not meant to be rowed, Progress was very slow. They've had a breakdown, thought Tom. Serves them right. Now wait till I tackle them and find out where my boat is. I've good notion to have Andy Foger arrested. The sailing craft swiftly approached the motorboat. Tom could see the three occupants looking at him, apprehensively as well as curiously, he thought. Guess they didn't think I'd keep after him, mused the young inventor. And a little while later, he was beside the Red Streak. Well, cried Tom angrily, it's about time you came back. We've had a breakdown, remarked Andy, and seemed quite humiliated. He was beginning to find out that he didn't know much about motorboats since he thought he did. I've been waiting for you. Waiting for us? What for? asked Sam Snedeker. What for? As if he didn't know, blurted out the owner of the Arrow. I want my boat, Andy Foger, the one you stole from me and hid. Tell me where it is at once or I'll have you arrested. Your boat, repeated the bully, and there was no mistaking the surprise in his tones. Yes, my boat. Don't try to bluff me like that. I'm not going to bluff you. We've been away three days and just got back. Yes, I know you have. You took my boat with you, too. Are you crazy? demanded Pete Bailey. No. But you fellows must have been to think that you could take my boat and not and without me knowing it," said Tom, and filled with wrath, grasped the gunwale of the red streak as he feared it would suddenly shoot away. "Look here," burst out Andy, and he spoke sincerely. "We didn't touch your boat, did we, fellas?" "No," exclaimed Sam and Pete at once, and they were very much in earnest. "We didn't even know it was stolen, did we?" went on Andy. No, agreed his chums. Tom looked unconvinced. We haven't taken your boat, and we can prove it, continued the bully. I know you and I have had quarrels, but I'm telling you the truth, Tom Swift. I never touched your boat. There was no mistaking the sincerity of Andy, and he was not a skillful deceiver. And Tom, looking into his squint eyes, which were open unusually wide, could not but help believing the fellow. We haven't seen it since the day we had the collision, added Andy, and his chums confirmed this statement. We went off on a little cruise, 
continued the red-haired bully, and broke down several times. We, we had bad luck. Just as we were nearing home, something went wrong with the engine again. I never saw such a poor motor. But we never took your boat, Tom Swift, and we can prove it. Tom was in despair. He had been so sure that Andy was the thief that to believe otherwise was difficult. Yet he felt that he must. He looked at the disabled motor of the Red Streak and viewed it with the interested and expert eye of a machinist, no matter if the owner of it is, was his enemy. Then suddenly a brilliant idea came into Tom's head. End of chapter 15. Okay. Let's go back over to here. Go back over to here. Alrighty. So that pretty much cuts that down. That's three chapters tonight. I want to thank you guys for joining us. I really do appreciate it. We will... I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, we will see you again on Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, if you have any thoughts about the next book, go ahead and leave them in the suggestion box below. You can follow me on Twitter at VO by Kurt. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash storytime with Kurt. And that's about it. We will see you next time. Have a good evening.